In the lecture section on the antebrachium, we talked about the long digital flexor and extensor muscles acting on the joints of the hand. At the time, we made passing reference to the smaller intrinsic muscles of the hand responsible for fine-tuning movements and precision recall. We return to the subject now with our session on the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Welcome back. With the scaffolding of the hand in place, we can now start placing muscles in the appropriate locations. In the arm and forearm, we discuss the anterior and posterior compartments and the muscles found in each. Hand is a bit of a different situation, however. No intrinsic muscles are found within the dorsum or back of the hand, only the long extensor tendons. All the muscles we are about to discuss are contained within the anterior compartment, although there are some subcompartments that we will be discussing. For this part of the lesson, we'll start with a look at these compartments. We'll then discuss the muscles found in each of these compartments and some of the clinical correlations as well. The compartments of the hand are divided by fascial septa. Deep to the skin is the superficial fascia, which can be divided into dorsal and palmar segments according to the location of the dorsal or ventral surfaces of the hand, respectively. Along the majority of the surface, the superficial fascia is loose areolar connective tissue. In the mid-region of the palm, however, the palmar fascia thickens into the dense regular connective tissue of the palmar aponeurosis, which provides the anchor for the palmaris longus muscle. Distally, the aponeurosis projects to each of the carpal digits, contributing transverse ligamentous bands at the level of the metacarpal phalangeal joint to anchor the distal ends of the metacarpals 2 through 5 together. In the digits, the dense fascia projects deep to form fibrous sheaths that envelop the flexor tendons. More on that later. The palmar aponeurosis is the fascia involved in the formation of dubutrans contracture, involving a thickening and shortening of the collagen fibers that prevent full extension. The cause is idiopathic, meaning unknown, but there appears to be a genetic component, as it is common in individuals of Scandinavian descent and presents with the family history in 60-70% to 70 of cases. Treatment typically involves different types of surgical release, although less invasive collagenase injections can also be used. Proximal to the wrist, the fascia is oriented in a transverse direction, resulting in a thin retinaculum commonly referred to as the palmar carpal ligament. The fascia projects deeper, forming a much thicker ligamentous connection between the pisiform and hamulus medially and the scaphoid and trapezium laterally. This is the deep transverse ligament and is considered the true flexor retinaculum of the wrist, forming the roof of the carpal tunnel. Notice that the tendons of the distal flexors all travel deep to the deep transverse ligament, which prevents these structures from bowstringing, whereas the tendons of the carpal flexors all travel superficial to the structure. The carpal flexors rely on much weaker palmar carpal ligaments to keep from bowstringing. Laterally, the fascia thins, running superior to the thenar and hyperthenar eminence over the thumb and little finger, respectively. A small muscle is found embedded in the fascia projecting towards the hypothenar eminence. This is the palmaris brevis, which appears to play a role in protecting the ulnar artery and nerve, which run inferior to this space. The cross-section to the hand shows the extent of the fascial projections. Note the dorsal fascia posteriorly and palma fascia anteriorly with the thickening of the palmar aponeurosis in the mid-palmar region. In this cross-sectional view, we can also see the deep projections of the palmar fascia, which divide the hand into numerous muscular compartments separated by fascial planes that allow small amounts of glide between the compartments. Just deep to the palmar aponeurosis is the central compartment, which houses the long flexor tendons from the anterior compartment of the forearm. The central compartment is separated from deeper regions by the mid-palmar space to assist with tendon gliding. Lateral to the central compartment is the thenar compartment. As we will discuss later, this contains the intrinsic thenar muscles which generate precision movements of the thumb. The thenar compartment is separated from the deeper structures by the thenar space, which again facilitates gliding during muscular contractions. Medial to the central compartment is the hypothenar compartment. 
The intrinsic hypothenar muscles coordinate precision movements of the little finger. The interosseous compartment is so named for its location between the carpal bones. This houses the interosseous musculature that we will discuss later. Finally, the abductor compartment contains a single muscle responsible for thumb adduction. This image on the right gives us a view of the mid-palmar and thenar spaces from the previous slide in a frontal view. Remember, these represent spaces between the central compartment superficially and adductor and interosseous compartments deep. You'll observe this in the dissection lab when you slide your index finger between the central and deeper compartments and when you ultimately reflect away the long digital flexors. Again, this represents a fascial plane that allows the tendons to slide along the deep compartments while minimizing friction. It's time to look at the intrinsic muscles of the hand. We'll start by looking at the thenar muscles controlling the thumb. They form the thenar eminence of fleshy tissue at the base of the thumb and share a common origin off the lateral margin of the flexor retinaculum and trapezium and trapezoid bone. The group is innervated by the recurrent branch of the median nerve. Damage to this recurrent branch or to the median nerve at any point proximal to the recurrent branch results in loss of innervation to this muscle group, which greatly affects precision movements of the hand. Long-term loss results in muscle wasting and extension retroposition contracture of the thumb, colloquially known as ape hand deformity. The most lateral of this muscle group is the abductor pollicis brevis muscle. It inserts from the lateral surface of the first metacarpal bone and, as the name implies, works with the abductor pollicis longus muscle to abduct the first digit. Medial to the abductor pollicis brevis is the flexor pollicis brevis. It's a bicipital muscle having a superficial lateral head and a deep medial head, which arises from the medial aspect of the first metacarpal bone, separated by the tendon of flexor pollicis longus muscle. This muscle inserts in the proximal phalanx as well. It inserts on the phalanx medial to the abductor pollicis brevis muscle to generate precision flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Note that it does not cross into the distal phalanx and therefore does not act upon the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. Also note that the small medial head is innervated by the ulnar nerve in contrast to the remainder of the thenar eminence. The third muscle lies deep in the compartment and can be seen by spreading the medial and lateral borders of abductor pollicis brevis and flexor pollicis brevis respectively. From the flexor retinaculum, the opponent's pollicis runs down and lateral to insert on the lateral surface of the first metacarpal along its whole length. The muscle acts to flex the carpal metacarpal joint and rotate the pad of the thumb to face the palm through manipulation of the subtle movements permitted in the interphalangeal joints. Many texts refer to this motion as thumb opposition. Next, we'll consider the hypothenar muscles. They form the fleshy region at the base of the pinky finger, the hypothenar eminence. These muscles also originate off the flexor retinaculum, although on the medial side, as well as from the hook of the hamate and the pisiform bones. The name, appearance, and function of these three muscles are strikingly similar to what we observe for the thenar eminence, in this case with precision control over the pinky finger. One distinct difference is their innervation by the ulnar nerve like most of the remaining muscles of the hand. As with the abductor pollicis brevis muscle, the abductor digiti minimi lies furthest from the midline of the hand. The muscle inserts on the anteromedial surface of the fifth metacarpal and the joint capsule of the fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint. It serves as the sole abductor of the little finger. The next muscle in this group is the flexor digiti minimi brevis which mirrors the flexor pollicis brevis muscle as being closest to the midline of the hand. Flexor digiti minimi brevis inserts on the anteromedial surface of the first phalanx of the fifth digit. It therefore serves as a flexor of the fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint. Now you may have noticed something a little strange about this nomenclature of this particular muscle. If this is the flexor digiti minimi brevis muscle, where's the longus? Didn't I recently say that any time there's a muscle with a brevis in it, there's always going to be a muscle with a longus in it as well? Well, there is in fact a longus, but it's a rare anatomical variant that's found in only a small percentage of the population. In most people, however, it represents the one case where a brevis muscle is left unmatched. 
Once again, we find the opponent's muscle deep in the compartment to match the thenar counterpart. Again, this muscle runs obliquely to insert, this time, on the medial surface of the fifth metacarpal. As with the opponent's pollicis, it contracts to flex the carpal metacarpal joint and draw the pad of the little finger towards the palmar surface of the hand. The abductor compartment contains a single muscle to identify, the abductor pollicis muscle. This is another example of a bicipital muscle with an oblique head originating off the base of the second and third metacarpal and a transverse head attaching to the shaft of the third metacarpal. The fibers converge on the medial surface of the proximal phalanx of the first digit. As the name implies, contraction generates adduction of the thumb towards the palmar surface of the hand. Arguably one of the most unique set of muscles in the body are the lumbricals. The name is a Latin term for earthworm, which adequately describes their appearance. What's unique is that these muscles have no direct bony attachment. The lateral two lumbricals are unipennate, originating off the tendons to the index and middle fingers. The medial two lumbricals are bipennate, originating off the tendons of digits two and three and three and four, respectively. For each lumbricle, the tendinous slips pass anterolateral to the metacarpal phalangeal joint to insert on the extensor hood. As such, each muscle contributes to the flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joints, but extension of the interphalangeal joints. Interestingly, the innervation pattern for these muscles mirrors that for the flexor digitorum profundus muscle that they originate off of. While the medial two lumbricals are both innervated by the ulnar nerve, the lateral two are innervated by the median nerve. One last group of muscles are the interossei so named for their position between the metacarpal bones. The muscles are subdivided according to their specific locations and appearance. The three palmar interossei are unipennate, originating off of metacarpals 2, 4, and 5 on the side closest to the midline. Their tendons pass anterior to the metacarpal phalangeal joint on the side closest to the midline, located at the third digit, to once again insert on the extensor hood. These muscles contract to adduct digits 2, 4, and 5 towards the midline through digit 3. The four dorsal interossei are bipennate muscles, each originating off the shafts of adjacent mesocarpal bones. Again, the tendons pass anterior to the metacarpal phalangeal joint, this time on the side further away from the midline digit. Contraction, therefore, abducts the digits away from the midline at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Note that while digit 3 has no palmar interossei muscle attachment, it has two dorsal interossei attachments to abduct a digit to either side of the midline. Also note, for both dorsal and palmar interossei, that because each band passes anterior to the metacarpal phalangeal joint to insert on the extensor hood, each assists the lumbricals with flexion of the metacarpal phalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joints. Before leaving the muscles of the hand, we turn our attention briefly back to the tendons of the long flexor muscles discussed in the previous lesson. As previously mentioned, these tendons are encased in the flexor retinaculum proximally and within two fibrous sheaths within the digits distally. This prevents bowstringing and is often required for tendons crossing more than one joint. Here's a theoretical example to illustrate this point. On the left, we have a single joint muscle attached very close to the fulcrum of the joint. When the muscle contracts, its architecture keeps it in close proximity to the fulcrum. On the right is a multi-joint setup where one of the muscle attachments is away from the fulcrum. In this situation, the muscle has a tendency to bow out during contraction. The retinacula and fibrous sheaths, therefore, serve as pulleys, ensuring that the tendons are held in close approximation to the fulcrum, even when the attachment points are away from the fulcrum. The only problem with this pulley design is the friction that it places on the tendons as they repeatedly slide back and forth in these tight spaces. The issue is resolved by wrapping each tendon in a thin synovial membrane known as a synovial sheath. The structure and function of the sheath may seem a little confusing at first, but it can be best compared to a slippery snake toy, which is an elongated rubber tube filled with fluid. 
The toy is named for the fact that when grabbed, the rubber tube tends to roll upon itself, slipping out of the individual's hand. Now imagine that we had an object, such as a pencil, running through the empty central core of the snake. The rubber maintains contact with both the skin of the hand and the pencil without ever rubbing against either of these surfaces. The friction is instead transferred to the fluid medium inside the rubber capsule. The same is true with respect to the synovial sheaths. Here we see the example of a synovial sheath encased in the digital fiber sheath anchored to an underlying phalanx. The complex as a whole is referred to as an osteofibrous tunnel. As the tendon slides back and forth within the sheath during flexion extension movements, the sheath maintains contact with the fibrous capsule externally and tendon internally, similar to the rubber on both sides of the hand and the pencil. The sheath surrounding the tendons as it passed under the flexor retinaculum to enter the central compartment is quite extensive. Wrapping around the collection of tendons as a whole, preventing friction with the retinacula as well as with themselves. The bursa in this region is referred to as the common flexor sheath or ulnar bursa. Distally, the digital flexor sheaths surrounding each individual tendon are simplified, bearing a more striking resemblance to the slippery snake toy we just described. Notice that the sheath surrounding the tendons to the little finger are continuous with the common flexor sheath in the central space. This is of significance in instances of inflammation. Infections of the synovial sheath, known as tenosynovitis, can occur following deep lacerations that penetrate the sheath. For digits 2 through 4, the inflammation is limited to the proximal boundary of the synovial sheath. In the case of the little finger, however, the infection has the opportunity to spread proximally past the flexor retinaculum. This has serious implications as the region beneath the retinaculum, known as the carpal tunnel, has limited room for expansion. Tenosynovitis in the carpal tunnel would therefore place significant compressive forces on the structures contained within, resulting in pain and difficulty with finger motions. Also note the presence of the median nerve in this space. Compressive forces can lead to median nerve neuropathy and compromise the distal branches. You remember the recurrent branch of the median nerve supplying the thenar muscles? Well, that would certainly be affected in this situation. Any condition that results in swelling of the structures contained within the carpal tunnel via tenosynovitis or tendonitis is classified as carpal tunnel syndrome and can have dramatic implications for hand function. Note that the flexor pollicis longus tendon also passes through the carpal tunnel and is wrapped in a separate synovial sheath known as the radial bursa, which also extends to the carpal tunnel. Tenosynovitis of the thumb could therefore also result in carpal tunnel syndrome if not properly resolved. Another consequence of inflammation is catching of the tendons in the osteofibrous tunnels, resulting in pain and difficulty in movements of the fingers, especially with flexion. This results from thickenings of either the tendon or the fibrous wall of the tunnel, which generates friction between the swollen elements sliding against one another. The medical term is stenosing tenosynovitis, but is more commonly referred to as trigger finger due to the sudden snapping and jerking of the finger upon flexion and extension as the swollen segments clear one another. The nodule shown here would get temporarily caught up in the fibrous sheath, then suddenly spring free on one or the other side, similar to the initial resistance and release experienced when firing a gun. Inflammation is also common along the long thumb abductors and extensor tendons. In this case, it is specifically called de Quervain tenosynovitis for the physician that first described it, although more recently texting thumb has entered the vernacular. I'm sure you can guess why. Important area of focus for both OSTs and PTs in the future. Overuse syndromes from extensive text messaging are going to be on the rise over the next several years. Taking a look at the dorsum of the hand, we can again identify some key features. First, note the presence of the synovial sheath surrounding the tendons as they pass inferior to the extensor retinaculum. Also note the tendinous interconnections between the tendinous slips as they project towards the digits, causing them to work as a functional unit. As the extensor tendons pass the metacarpal phalangeal joint, they expand into the extensor hoods. The split is quite elaborate. A portion of the main tendon runs bilaterally, running on either side of the proximal interphalangeal joint to insert on the distal interphalangeal joint.
In addition, an intermediate central band runs over the proximal interphalangeal joint to insert on the middle phalanx. Also note the arrangement of lumbricol and palmar and dorsal interossei muscle insertions, as well as the arrangement of the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus tendons described in the previous lesson. The orientation of these tendons helps to explain two different phenomena. A rupture of the lateral band attachment to the distal phalanx results in an inability to extend the distal interphalangeal joint, resulting in an abnormal distal interphalangeal joint flexor, a condition known as mallet finger, due to the finger's resemblance to a hammer. Note that proximal interphalangeal joint extension is preserved. Rupture of the central tendon from the middle phalanx is a bit more difficult to um, comprehend. We still see normal distal interphalangeal extension, but note that the lateral bands are located just barely posterior to the rotational axis of the proximal interphalangeal joint. As a result, the unbalanced pull of the digitorum flexor tendons tends to force the proximal interphalangeal joint to push up through the slip of lateral tendons, like a button through, pushing through a buttonhole. This results in an odd combination of proximal interphalangeal joint flexion and distal interphalangeal joint extension. It's called a boutonniere deformity due to the mechanism just described. Both conditions can be corrected using custom splints to properly align the segments. That wraps up this lengthy session on the muscles of the hand. After a well-deserved break, we'll start in with the neurovascular and surface anatomy of the hand. See you then.